Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Fierce Fiction Fun Club. I'm Patty Templeton. Um, I am a fiction writer and archivist, and I'm here with Zigzag Claiborne, uh, who's going to be our first reader today. But first, before you start reading, Zigzag, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody out there at ReaderCon. I'm Zigzag Claiborne. I write spec fic, weird fic, comedy, satire, occasionally erotica, so, but you won't be getting any of that today, sorry. And I am ready to put words in your ears. Yes. <laughs> so the first selection will be from, let's put on the glasses, the Kurt glasses, there we go. So we're gonna be reading from this book, By All Our Violent Guides, which there we go, no glare. So this is a, this is kind of a, ghost story book, but the section I'm reading you is just character stuff. And I am going to start now without giving you any leeway because I am just that much of a putz. Absently, she sifted sand through her fingers, leaving a layer across the toes of his feet. A man had asked her to marry him. That shouldn't have felt strange, but it did. She had never really felt a part of anything and now she was being asked to become part of another human being. She continued laying sand across his feet. This was extremely scary, but wasn't that what it was all about? A world of questions swirled about her head. How could a woman who had never truly felt important in her life convince a man of, its, of sincerity? And she desperately wanted him to know she was sincere about everything she said and did. The elephant burial sounded crazy, but it made sense. It really did. Quest used to be a regular part of everyday life. To search for, deliver to, keep from, aspire to, congress with. Used to be, but it faded away for no good reason. The world, being all about connections and revealing and seeing, was something to get away from for a while. Privacy was necessary and death was about the only private moment left. Had she really agreed to marry him? Five minutes of burying his toes hadn't led any closer to coherence. Explaining to herself why it was good to be married while explaining to him about the potency of summer nights and the ineffable loneliness the sound of a cricket could prod loose didn't seem to help, but he understood it was a loneliness which permeated even death. Most people in coffins cry uncontrollably. Regina visited her mother often enough to know that cemeteries, no matter what time of day, never escaped the enforced quietude of night. She told him about visiting her mother. The wind, spring wind, slightly chilled, blew, it disturbed the grass around the headstone with the sweet word, mother. And even at 10 in the morning, it felt like night. In the summer, bees flitted dangerously close, leaving the living with a greater sense of living and sweat annoyed the spine. If the wind blew in the cemetery, it did so like an ex-friend. The wind tended to be ignored. Other mourners off with their own dead tended to be ignored. There were never many anyway. As folks stared down at their graves, as folks dredged up loss, the world tended to flatten out, become slate gray above and behind, funneling background noise into their ears without assigning distinction to any particular sound except cars, car horns, car doors, the susurration of traffic sometimes, the knowledge that someone had arrived, someone was leaving. There was point A, and while one stood immobile, the world was not prevented from reaching point B. Life went on in cars. Graveyards were terribly, terribly lonely places, and the earth itself was a huge, indistinct graveyard. No more. She had agreed to marry him. He needed something to solidify himself. Will you let him draw you, she asked, knowing 
asking Schaefer might be awkward, but he'd relent. There was no choice. Schaefer was an artist and the world was losing subjects in droves. I'll think about it, said Dennis. And now we jump to the next section, just a little few hours after. Sometimes Dennis was unsure what to make of things, things like poetry and certain stories, poetic stories, things that didn't hopefully explain themselves or go where they were supposed to go, were the things he didn't immediately or ever understand, a benefit in a way he didn't actually need to understand. In addition to seeing his father naked, he'd also seen a woman who inhabited three distinct bodies. He used to wait during lunch for her to pass his spot in the park to see which body she had that day. He knew her by her walk. Over a three month period, he fell in love with her body language because it was his secret way of knowing. He now sat at Regina's kitchen table. He was surrounded by a house that was all the house of Regina and Ophelia, not of James. My last name is James, he murmured. The kitchen counter was not the color he would have chosen. He hadn't carried that refrigerator in. Its weight was outside his experience. He didn't like blinds, he liked curtains. My last name is James. He wanted to marry this woman, had wanted to marry that other mysterious woman. She might have loved him if she'd known he was the only man alive who knew what she was. He should have approached her. Passing, she had to have noticed him enough times. He could have said hi, but she was beautiful each time. And it's impolite to talk to a woman simply because she's beautiful. No metaphors, she was beautiful. She wasn't all women. He wasn't particularly shy. For a while, he'd become obsessed with getting there on time to see her pass, to see how she pretended to be people. She dressed like a business person. The park was littered with business people and pigeons, some off by themselves, others pecking together in cross-legged groups around the rim of the fountain he liked. The one of Athena with its halting water supply regurgitated from cruddy bronze fishes into a pool that practically cried because no one, no one ever looked into it. It was silly to feel sorry for a goddess in downtown Briar. I needed you, he imagined she thought of him, to love me too. The accusation shrunk the Neville's kitchen around his heart. She was the ghost whispering forlorn admonitions. I could have loved you, he defended, lost. You should have implored me to believe. Swimming in belief the way Regina asked him to believe. Regina, who asked him to bury her with elephants in Africa, a 38 year old black woman from Dorset. Her thoughts and moods melted down during the night to a fine tip of gold. Gold simple and pure enough to be edible without spectacle. Eaten like a cracker. Buried with elephants and betrothed on the same day. He stole in to watch her sleep. Weather stayed too hot down here, a factor he hoped wouldn't affect him too much. She slept so wild. Sometime tomorrow, they talk some more, try to understand the functions of love. He rested against the doorway, arms folded, naked, suddenly wanting to wake her and admit, I can't sleep. Your sketch bothers me. He saw eyes in the woods behind her, beady red ones that chewed the knuckle bones. He grinned at the word, knuckle bones. The mind's eye saw her breast on paper. It excited him. That meant it had excited the artist, Herbert Dennis whispered. What else was in this house besides him and her? Naked and bored, he explored. He touched things he had never touched before. Original paneling, the servile figurines in the kitchen, he never held them and looked at them the way he looked at them now in the light of the refrigerator. He went to the basement and walked around without turning on the lights, feeling like a ghost, afraid to find himself already waiting down there. He made it to the small sofa, the center of it, and spread his arms out. He studied the dark, letting the basement's forms coalesce into images until he stopped trying to ignore his body's nervous signs. Ever so slightly, his stomach tugged at his groin. 
He took a deep, quiet breath and brought his vulnerable arms to the cushions, pushing himself to his feet. The basement followed him upstairs, a yawning maw thrown over the interior of the home so quickly he could do nothing except head straight and single-mindedly for the bed to clunk in beside Regina, who might wake up or at least unconsciously snuggle closer to him. She kept sleeping, snoring softly. He decided that was enough. And now I turn it over to the fantastic, fabulous, and fierce Patty Templeton. Oh man, but before you do, that was wonderful. Oh, thank um, you. I think like one of the most interesting things about your writing is how you you jump genre. Like it you're in genre sometimes, you're in sci-fi, you're in fantasy, you're in what feels like contemporary spaces, but are they? Like, and I think I think that is just it's juicy and it's wonderful and it makes me always love a new thing from you because I don't know what I'm gonna get <laughs> thank you thank you you know I, I I always say I like approaching writing as if I'm an actor because actors get to do all kinds of roles and I think writers should get to do that too yeah uh, well I'm gonna take a sip from my squid mug hey, hey. I think I'll grab a sip too everybody <clears throat> out there in reader con land grab a sip of something yeah Gotta stay hydrated, even if the con is at home. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm gonna read today from uh, Ghoul, volume two. Uh, this is a really cool zine that has work from me in it. Uh, CSE Cooney has several mm -hmm. poems in it. There's a lot of lovely art uh, and also my uh, wonderful fellow made it. So I am really blessed with having an amazingly talented a uh, handsome man who makes really and that amazing. Cover is so gorgeous. <sighs> it's great. So I'm going to read from a short story, the first little bit from a uh, nitrate night at Gray Lake, and this Love is it. it's it. super cool. Ah, that is so cool. Yeah, like even the letters have like watery shadows to them. It's wonderful. Okay, um, and trying to be. Uh, fierce and fun and happy instead of gloomy, I decided to write a love story. I don't know if Momo's drive-in is the only drive-in on a lake there ever was, but it's the only one I've been to. The screen's a massive billboard that some dipshit capitalist installed on Gray Lake in the 90s. Everybody'd boycott whoever advertised there, so no one did, and then the dipshit capitalist died of gold-coated arteries or whatever afflicts the rich. The billboard never got torn down and the back was near enough to the quarry cliff that enterprising a-holes would climb over and spray messages like, hail Satan, hail Satan, <laughs> or T go to prom with me. These being my teenage contributions. Yes, I still wear satin jackets and yes, I'm still with T. And oh my God, isn't it precious? My partner's name is T and my name is Time. I hope the weight of my side eye sinks you to the lake's bottom near all the name themed gifts T and me have thrown in. Momo came to Gray Lake the way Clint Eastwood walked into Westerns. Day was regular, then they showed up and shifted the weight of things. World feels sturdier with certain people in it. One minute you're looking at the coffee shop and the street's empty. Then an airbrushed David Bowie themed pickup rolls by towing an airstream. The main drag's the only drag. Gray Lake isn't big. It's wooded. It's Midwest. It's not close enough to a city or a natural wonder to be popular. The lake the town's named for has that big dumb billboard and only recently stopped having fish kill from slaughterhouse runoff. The meat plant's so far away, the smell doesn't kick over, but groundwater does. It's a town of about 3,000. All it's got is a book and hardware store. It's mean times. Mean teas. The co-op, the diner that closes at three, the coffee shop that opens at three, a tattoo parlor in what used to be the schoolhouse, and a one-pump gas station. That dipshit dead capitalist bought a lot of land near the lake and hoped to turn us into some kind of Durango, full of oversized beige houses for richy shitties, but he didn't even have get all the way through the building of his own before he strolled Heart Attack Road. So Momo comes in, sets up their airstream by Gray Lake, paints the billboard white, 
buys old Jorge's tiny tugboat and starts projecting films from it. But this isn't Momo's story. They weren't there the night Ginny fell asleep with a SIG and set the lake ablaze. Momo was trading 35 millimeter plinths prints at an underground film fest near Nashville. And I don't drive bad juju, so this isn't a sad fire story. That shit was scary, but everything turned out fine. It's the story about how I proposed to tea after all these years, because there's a few flowers in life's bullshit showers and they need to be shared. At Momo's drive-in, you could set up a folding chair on shore and watch the movie for three bucks, rent a paddle boat for five, borrow a dinghy for eight, or get you the posh ass floating dock in the middle of the lake that has a sofa, a complimentary popcorn bucket, a tin canopy, and a dinghy for 20. No chatterbox dinks can drop anchor in front of the dock, so it feels like you're embedded in the film's flickering reflection. Floating dock at Momo's is the only place in Gray Lake that's ever needed a reservation. Sign up sheets in a labyrinth lunchbox screwed to Momo's Airstream next to the concession window. I reserved a Friday the 13th because it was a Friday the 13th I fell for tea. We were 15 and she asked me to go dancing naked in the woods, technically in a graveyard in the woods. She said it was a significant ritual. I found out later this translated to, and I quote, I wanted to woo you, you shy schmoop. Up till T moved to town to live with her auntie, Gray Lake didn't have any lesbians but me. At least none that I could find. Only possibility was Sudha, a barista at the coffee shop, but she was twice my age and I wasn't even sure she was a lesbian. She just wore a lot of Frankie Goes to Hollywood and Depeche Mode shirts. Back then, T had a neon pink Afro mohawk, was from Chicago, and I couldn't believe she danced naked in the woods. Who does that? And who thinks to ask the book nerd who does push-ups at lunch to go with? Even though it was a significant ritual, I was late. I wasn't committed to getting naked, but I thought I'd stripped a boxers and sports bra and couldn't decide which drawers better asked, is this a flirting naked fire dance or a friend naked fire dance? I got there and T is booty bop and the young MCs bust a move with nothing on but sweat and firelight. I got naked. Couldn't sway worth a soft turd smoothie, but I tried and we laughed at how our tits flopped. I let her wear my blue satin jacket on the walk home. Didn't make, didn't make out, but we did become best friends. Walked slow circles around each other until we sucked face during a Twilight Zone marathon the next fall. Tea makes my world easier. I think that's what a good relationship does, helps more than hurts. My pop says when your lover makes you complain more than crow, they gotta go. He never remarried after mom's coming, going, then being gone. T and I can mash each other's bananas, but we make bread and get on with life again. And I don't care about marriage, but T does. So why not? 11 years in, and I don't want anything but our store and movie nights with her. Ergo, I got Momo to show Creature from the Black Lagoon on Friday, October 13th, because it's T's favorite monster movie on our favorite day in her favorite month. Only... My mid-movie proposal got royally effed in the A by Ginny dozing off in the tugboat's projection wheelhouse. It was a clear night with a big sky, orange and red trees at the shore. I had a black satin jacket with a jack-o'-lantern back patch. T wore a knee-length sweater striped the colors of candy corn over black leggings. We watched the gill man watch K. T, I gotta piss, I said after the gill man almost pulled K underwater. Go off the dock, she said. There's 10 paddle boats nearby, no. Bring red hots on your way back, she said. Eyes still on the screen. I moved an orange braid, kissed her shoulder, and took the dinghy, not to shore, but to the projection tugboat behind us. Tied on, climbed over. Ginny didn't stir from the wheelhouse, which isn't surprising. Ladies got crap hearing from disarming explosive as a comp explosives as a combat engineer in a war she doesn't talk about. The gill man suit was there. I shimmied into it and heard Ginny honk snore. I thought I smelled burnt toast, but I put on the creature head. The film reel wouldn't need switching, so I let Ginny be. Creature stepping from a tugboat 
to a dinghy is a crap time. Couldn't see, couldn't stretch my arms out, couldn't grasp right with webbed hands. The plan was to motor to the floating dock, jazz hand, sexy gillman dance around the sofa to the song Fever, then I'd one knee it and hold out a waterproof ring box attached to my gillman wrist by a string. Fire opals ain't cheap. T'd say yes and throw her arms around me. Old Jorge get photos from approximate paddle boat. Hopefully he'd catch my creature silhouette on one knee romancing T under a tin canopy. Luck prevailing, he'd frame in the movie. We'd blow up the photo and hang it in our living room. Here's your red hots. Let's live happily ever after. And yes, when the movie's done, I'll explain how I tried very hard to find a Gil Gal costume, but none were available that didn't cost more than our mortgage. The end. But I stumbled instead of stepped onto the floating dock. I'm placing it at 50% the creature costume's fault and 50% me being a goof who walks into walls and randomly falls. Always got a bruise somewhere. I didn't even stumble onto the dock. I stumbled off of the dock. Don't know when I lost the ring box, but I'm guessing then. T says she didn't hear me get back. Ginny was hurling F-bombs and, and reels off the tugboat. I didn't know you were there till I saw a plastic creature head sink. Only saw that because the lake top went firelight. How'd you know it was me? She gave me a girl who else in this town would it be eye roll? Short story long, I don't swim. I hate water. Don't like being wet. Hate showers. Tea likes baths and it ain't for me. I'm okay on a boat, but I only reserved the floating dock instead of doing a shore picnic because I knew tea'd love it. I tumbled from the dock, flailed and couldn't float. Couldn't grab the dock ladder with webbed hands, couldn't get the head off, couldn't push past the surface more than once before Gray Lake seeped into my Gilman getup and hastened me to the deep. The thing about nitrate, which Momo prided themselves on showing when they could, is it's ornery, highly combustible, a pretty boy wall puncher of a film. You never saw such a shine but filmmakers stopped using it for a reason, called the film that came after safety film and edge printed the words so you'd know the difference. Safety film could jam your projector, but it wouldn't immolate itself and your theater with it. Problem with nitrate is it can spark even when someone isn't smoking nearby. You, can put out an, you can't put out a nitrate fire, even with water, you gotta let it burn. The creature from the Black Lagoon wobbled on the screen as Ginny shucked reels from an oar's end out of the wheelhouse. The fire pile was behind the helm, but the projector was fine. Film roamed red over the lake and waves spread it further as dinghies and paddle boats tore toward shore. This all happened in maybe 60 seconds. Get back, fall off dock, lake on fire, I'm drowning. One minute can hold more than one terror. T saw my creature head go under. Mm. So I'll stop there with that. <laughs> oh, so, so gosh. It's been a while, book. guys. It's been a it's been a while, reader con folks, since I've uh, read in front of people. And uh, that was fun, but also stumbly. So I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> oh, that was so good. I mean. You know, every story of yours has hallmarks of great language, emotional honesty, and always a surprise in there. Not a not a gotcha surprise, but just a surprise that goes straight from the brain to the heart. And, uh, I happen to know the end of the story, so everybody out there reading high, you need to get that one so you can find out that it's worth rereading oh, several times. And if you order it soon, some of the ghouls still have like a wow. uh, swamp monster cutout. <laughs> it was like a bonus that he put into some of them. So that's pretty great. And uh, I forgot to hold this up uh, during your story. <laughs> we had I the same your idea because I was holding up signs while you were reading because damn, everything was good. Yeah. I had that one. And then I uh, also had this one. 
but you got me so into your story that I didn't hold them up. <laughs> I feel it's like we, we got our own uh, old Batman show going, which is like cool as hell. So well, we're going to switch it up, right? So now we're going to read a little bit from each other's work to switch up the back end of this. Yeah. So I want to jump in and you guys are lucky enough to get a double shot of Patty Templeton stories. This one is called Pep and Luna's. I want to try to do the language justice because it is so gorgeous. I mean, just listen to this. You ain't gonna find a better dive than Pep and Luna's on rural route two. It's past the second cornfield to the right and straight on till midnight. Get to the quarry and you've gone too far. Luna chitter a creek curse at me for calling it a dive. Pepit straightened her yellow neckerchief, dignified like, and called it a roadhouse. It's a tin roof wooden box with a neon sign and gravel lot. We got 13 bar stools and three round tables. Only time we're full is the first Friday of the month when there's live music behind chicken wire in the left corner. That's my left, so you're right. Hooch, water, and coffee on hand. Get hungry, and we got a two-buck baked potato. I'd call the place heaven if I didn't already call it work. Someone's got to finagle the day shift for those two. Three kinds stumbling here. Regulars, rubbernecks, and wrong turns. There's a looky-loo wide eye about you. I, I get it, I do. I was once where you're at now. Maybe you bummed a hitch or a smoke, and they settled the story with a debt. I mean, sorry, sell up the debt with a story. More likely, you read about us while truck stopped shitter sitting. Ain't it a roadside rule that a stall's walls have peculiar pronouncements? I myself learned of Pep and Luna's, not from a biker, but the blind parrot on her shoulder. Go on and gawk. It's the only bar out there with moonshine pouring from a spigoted, chicken footed, Back by our bathtub connected to clear pipes impersonating crown molding the joint open. It ain't ordinary. But you knew that before walking in. You heard this here is a mermaid bar, and you heard it right. Pull up a bar stool and quit looking over your shoulder. Luna ain't gonna walk in the front door. She's gonna swim in. Besides, shift change is until four. Pep will pop in the back door and Luna will plop into that jar there by the coffee maker. She'll slide down from the bathtub. No, I don't know if she's sleeping there now or if she's in the back. And no, I won't check. She's a light sleeper and is rude. Furthermore, I ain't effing up her process. I don't know if it's in the sleeping or the swimming, but something Luna does turns water into white light. I refill that tub myself. I know for verified fact that water goes in. Then that miniature mermaid in all her pudgy bolo tie wearing bald wonder turns it into hooch. So mind your manners, she gets upset and it tastes like coffin varnish, which means don't be the boner who asks her to transform from mergal to gams of plenty when she gets here. It ain't your business what her bottom half can or can't do. Go on, try some, but sip slow. It's snockering stuff. Pep brought a slew of those tin mugs back from Big Rock Candy Mountain. If you're wondering how in the corn high hell a human and a mermaid became best friends and opened a dive down the road from the edge of nothing, it's because of Big Rock Candy Mountain. What it used to be and what it became. See, Pep's an adventurer or was settled these days. But before the bar, there was the road and Pep's brown boots tread more miles than you could fling a fan dancing elephant at. She rode the rails, was a riverboat gambler, sold sequined suits for country stars, worked as a pin setter in a bowling alley ran by the mob. And that's not the half of it. Big Rock Candy Mountain was supposed to be her retirement. But nothing goes according to plan. And if it's Pep's plan, you can double dunk that donut. Ask her, and Pep won't say how her bad knees made it to Big Rock Candy Mountain. 
She'll declare it took 40 days and 40 nights on foot. She'll point at the walking stick nailed above the door. But she doesn't like to jaw on it. She wanted hobo heaven and found a ruin. Bluebird carcasses and busted crystal fountains. A surface mine mountain, cigarette tree stumps. Costly lofts where life used to be free. Bad coffee. Now ask Nona and she'll sing on the sweet old days, the gin lake, big sky, fireflies. Pepple pipe up and interrupt, say Luna gleamed in a moonbeam first time she saw her. Say the world's smallest mermaid, bare knuckle box, the world's filthiest mutt, and a near dry creek bed. Luna ain't want to be outdone. She'll remind Pep that the only puddle she had left in what used to be a corn liquor river was from the frothing mouth of that mongrel. If Pep's in her cups, she'll roll up a denim pant leg and flash the gash that Fleebies bestowed. She tried to send it packing and instead it got snacking. Luna tail smacked the dog's eye to tatter before it let go and get. They'll say they saved each other. Pep offered a mason jar, Luna climbed in. Like the shine, but said she made better. She ate Pep's with hidden chips while Pep bandaged the bite. Got to chatting. Both wanted more than they had and found increase in each other. I ain't sure on details, but they got plastered and lit candles in the creek bed. A friendship made over shadow and flame with a cloud covered moon as witness. They got walking, albeit crooked, hanging on the lamppost here and corn stalks there. Luna in her jar in the chest pocket of Pep's overalls. Didn't stop for 40 days and 40 nights. Lord save their livers. Wouldn't have halted either, but for the both of them spotting a jackalope's ghost engrossed in the harvest moon. It was a good enough omen to quit Rome. But like I said, Pep and Luna come in at four. You can ask them yourself about all the hindsights and good nights they got together. Meantime, you want another drink? I love your writing. Love your reading. Oh, thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, why'd you want to read that? That story is an epic. I mean, it's like in four pages, you have an entire Lord of the Rings <laughs> love story basically happening here between Pep and Luna and the fact that Luna is this teeny little mermaid. I mean, the characters, the language, I just, that story makes me, it makes me want to read it out loud to people. Mm. That's, that's, I love it. Oh man, and for people looking for it, you can find it in the January issue of Mermaids Monthly, which is so amazing. Like Julia Rios uh, is the main editor for that or was for this past year. I believe it's gonna be changing hands and they're gonna um, move it into a new and vibrant other folks running it scene just to get diversity into the magazine. But uh, look for Mermaids Monthly if you're looking for a good submission market that's, that's fun uh, and obviously about mermaids. <laughs> And the stories are all surprising. They're not just, you know, you know, fish out of water stories. But these mm -hmm. all stories, they're just great, engaging stories. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I am going to read some work from Zigzag Claiborne here. Um, he has two new books out because he couldn't just be, you know, a normal human being and have one new book out. So <laughs> he has uh, Conversations with e Idris. Uh, and if we have time, I might read from it, but I mainly want to get, uh, Afro puffs or the antenna of the universe. I'm not sure if things are mirroring on the screen or not, so we'll see. But like, this book is beautiful. This cover is beautiful. Everything about this book is going to be like you slamming through it in like a day and a half audience. Like it at most, like it is immensely readable. Um, and it starts with a soundtrack. So if you love playlists, you're already gonna love this book, uh, page one. 
and because I wasn't sure what uh, what my partner here was going to read today, I chose a strange, odd, weirdo side character to introduce you to in this book. <laughs> His name is the Hellbilly. He's obnoxious uh, in a good way and in a bad way. We'll let you decide. He's messed up. It's great. Um, so basically you have uh, a group of badass women saving the universe and then the hellbilly is kind of like eh, stirring up some shit. So he's not their main problem. He's not even really on their radar that much until he is. So I'm going to read you a small snippet and then jump to another longer snippet. And also hopefully I can do it justice because the writing is it's got a hell of a voice, guys. It's, it's got a hell of a voice. <clears throat> the hell Billy didn't know how or why, but stupid shit since the moment of his birth to hear it told, which it was by his daddy, kept him at its epicenter. His father, a man who'd literally once told somebody to hold his beer so he could climb a tree to take a piss on a campfire, had also told the hellbilly a week before the funeral resulting from that climb that he, his son, was a mutant owing to his mother's excessive natal diet of Mountain Dew and cum. And of course, Daddy Boyd laughed at that part because he previous. Dad could run off a ready litany of weird, stupid shit that only ever happened when his boy, Middle, was around. Middle Boyd, my boy. Dad used to call him a genius of untold comedic talent. Wasted on this earth, the hellbilly thought ironically, the same as shit on concrete. Now we're gonna skip, cause he's about to get an assignment and I'm gonna skip to him going on the assignment. And he gets the assignment from a bad person, you know, a villainous person, so. But you know, he, he it's, it's a paycheck. <clears throat> He hadn't chosen the hellbilly. No, that was daddy too. After, after the first fight Boyd had had in his young life, a cat scratch, monkey thumbed, raggedy flailing scarecrow of a fight with a boy who kept bugging him in front of the hellbilly's own house. The hellbilly had been a licorice whip of a thing, still was scrawny with a big Adam's apple. No, back that up, the hellbilly was mm, wiry which meant strong coastal winds infringed on his personal cool. Reason 923 to hate Florida. But these old fucks didn't seem to have any problems. Again, guns in pockets, suckers were weighted. At least standing there outside this airport, he didn't have any loose fitting clothing. Undue flapping would have been mortifying beyond belief. Long hair didn't count. Long hair flapping was cool. His was that mangy, dirty blonde with unidentifiable, unidentifiable dark streaks that would have looked good on a rambunctious breed of mid-sized dog. Madame Thume, that villain, had indicated some choice places just begging for his brand of chaos theory. Just a little something to get people's attention and let them know that the Thume were a force, not a force, but the force to be reckoned with. Hell Billy give gave zero fucks either way. Madam paid him well and left him alone most of the time. He supposed a trip to Florida was a sliver compared to most crosses. Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, and then the sticks. He undid the top lace on his sleeveless denim vest to let some slurry in as gusts pounded him. His jean cargo shorts tailored to look like cutoffs, big ballooned a second, and he panicked that somebody might have seen that loss of manhood and cool, but all was clear. Airports were the den of no fucks given. He could have farted fire and flashed wings and people would have annoyedly bumped past him to get to whichever waiting car's exhaust awaited them. With the car rental, of course, being a mile away on the other side of the entire damn airport, he waited under a corrugated awning along with several other travelers trying to not breathe too deeply with every shuttle, but the one they needed chugging to stop near them, loading up and chugging off. He tried not 
looking at these people, unaware of the awesome power amongst them. Black lady with her grandkids, white dude bro who didn't know he'd flown to Florida to get Florida to get dumped by the girlfriend he kept haranguing on the phone for not being there to pick him up in this freaking heat. Two or three new retirees, college girl with more bags than her body weight and height could have allowed. Studying no less while she waited. Comparative mythology, damn. The hellbilly was impressed. If he'd been a freshman or sophomore, they might have had a life. But the here and now equaled it asphyxiation for both under the bright gulf sky. The whole world was just outside the airport. He hoped she'd find a bit of it. None of these people would receive the hellbilly's power. That was his promise. Except for complaining, dude, bro. He was annoying as hell. The hellbilly thought negatively of bro's future. That was all it took. Even though he had no idea of the shape of dude's impending misfortune, negative vibes were now a burr on dude's burpy-toned ass. Such was the power of the hellbilly, the hellbilly actually murmured. He glanced to make sure nobody heard, but college girl was too deep in thought. Old folks too focused on the indignities of traveling for the elderly, and Brosif's fuming had reached maxim maximum Brosifus. All he heard was hot-blooded squirting through his temples. Airport sucked. By the time the correct shuttle arrived, Boyd's entire mouth felt like he'd filleted a tailpipe for an hour, even though the wait was less than 10 minutes. The uncomfortable packed ride to the rental station was an exercise in meditation, lest he damn the entire human race. Shallow breathing, stare at the palms, no thoughts, no desires but one, get the fuck away from this airport, same thought as everybody else. The rental clerk, she too in hell, abstained from any attempt at customer service that gave a damn whether it was monitored or recorded. He drove off in a 2018 in posing, hit the hotel for a piss and a shower, then went straight to work. Hit him with some concentrated weird first. Burner phone in hand linked to private Thum GPS with hits pre-programmed. Loose, these colors don't run over the most boring boat shoes and khaki shorts he could find. Hell bile building up in him for maximum efficacy. Florida. The hellbilly put on sunglasses, got in the car, and pulled out into traffic going 15 miles below the speed limit as it was early afternoon and the old folk were out and about for errands. The first non-rich facility he hit suffered inexplicable and catastrophic data loss. Hellbilly didn't know this, but he walked with a teeny more pep in his step, which meant heinous fuckery delivered on target. Throughout the day, confirmations of fuckery being discovered rolled in on his phone. Fires, employee walkouts, secret emails calling for internal takeovers leaked by disgruntled staff who'd been fully gruntled before. A, a server full of dick pics blasted to Thum, Vampire, and Mo Kasugi, all with their owners identifying coding, because when you're high enough to store your dick in the cloud, you make sure that sucker's tagged for posterity. Ping, 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 went his phone. He was a driving, walking, smiling fool. Heading down one avenue on foot, he noticed a lady with a magnificent frizzy fro glancing at her phone as she rotated in a semicircle, chewing her cheek that way that said shit was about to be figured out, while three other women waited on her. They stood right in the middle of the sidewalk. There was no avoiding them. Another wore a similar frown, but she didn't have a phone. She merely stared directly at the hellbilly. Pardon, he, he said, head down to move through them. They parted. He moved on, something in him saying to move a little quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's a weird little tidbit of uh, Afro Puffs are the antenna of the universe. And uh, dear readers, dear listeners, dear audience, dear wonderful people in on this reading, he might have just stumbled into the most amazing female characters I have read in a long, long time that I hope you pick this book up and uh, read and meet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
huge praise. Thank you. And I love the reading of it. I, I'm sitting over here laughing because the way you read it was spot on. It was better oh. than I had written it. So, yeah. <laughs> I missed a couple words, so I feel like yeah, yeah. I almost did you justice. That, that almost made you want to write a sequel just with the hillbilly now. I want you to write anything and everything in this world. Like this world <laughs> is amazing that you've created. Like keep in it. Uh, for those who don't know, so this is not a sequel, but it is written in the world of what other book that you've written? The Brothers Jetstream Leviathan. So, all of so if you're if you're curious about that world, start with Leviathan, Brothers Jetstream Leviathan. Afro Plus on the Antenna of the Universe is kind of sort of a sequel, but like Petty said, not really a sequel sequel. So you don't have to read one for the other. But if you like fiction that like just says jump in, you know, we're gonna commit some crimes, that's what you <laughs> jump in, we're going to commit some crimes and then save the entire universe, probably like a couple, several times yeah. and then laugh while doing it here and there. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh man. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. And in that time, uh, do you want to tell folks either what you have upcoming or what you're working on right now? Ooh, um, I am working on a fantasy novel based off of characters from a short story I did early last year. So that'll be fun. It's kind of a mix of witchcraft and Conan the Barbarian action. Yes. And I'm not going to say much more about it than that, except I, it's fun writing it. Lots of fun. Oh, man. That's great. Um... Also, uh, we shared a anthology this year. We were in a table of contents together. So if people enjoyed yes. what they heard today, you can find us both together in Stitched Lips, uh, an anthology that came out in March, March of 2021. Yeah. Yeah, March, April-ish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Time has been not a good thing for us. So Yeah, which is yeah. why we wanted to have a Fierce Fiction Fun Club where we read some of our nicer, happier things and just had a good time instead of uh, that everything yeah. else, man. Yes, so these were yeah. not not good times, but we've got some good fiction out of it. We've got yeah, some, some good slow going, but good, yeah. Yes. Currently, I have a uh, in progress, um, a Critters, like the horror movie Critters inspired uh, monster truck story in space. So that's the thing that I'm working on right now and next, and we'll see what happens with it. Um, and outside of that, where can people find you, Clarence? Or I'm sorry, Zigzag Claiborne? They can find me um, Twitter at ZZ Claiborne, um, Facebook under Clarence Young, website right on, right on com, which is the first right on is W R I T E and on. And I don't want to leave this without telling you guys to find and buy Patty Templeton's book, There Is No Lovely End. Because <laughs> it's one of the best books I have. I mean, I, I talk about this book all the time. It's one of the best I've ever read. It's one of my favorite books. Get it. Don't ask what it's about. Just freaking go get it. <laughs> well, thank you, because it's always easier. I find plug friends than myself. Um, but I can be found on Twitter and Instagram, mostly at just at pattytemplton.com. There's websites and random else that I have out there. But if you want to find me and talk or hear music recommendations or give music recommendations, uh, we especially love to talk about music. So find us. Um, it would be absolutely lovely to hear from any of you reader or reading reader con uh, audience members today. Um, Anything else, Clarence, you want to end end on? Um, you know, as far as fierce and fun, I want to see if I can get this in here. Because not only is she <laughs> an excellent writer of world-class stature, but she draws. And look at that. That's a, so cool. <laughs> I love uh, you. Those being inside conversations with Idris. Uh, by Zigzag Claiborne that With art is by. available everywhere. Okay. All right. 
have a great day, everybody. And thank you so much, Zigzag, for hanging out with me. I love getting to hear you read. Have a great day, Patty. Anytime, anywhere, you and I reading. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Bye. Bye, everybody.